The COVID pandemic has been particularly difficult for the National Museum of Computing and the EDSAC project. Because of government rules, the museum had to shut in March and only reopened in September. Um, volunteers weren't able to leave their homes to come and work on the machine, um, even um, as individuals, let alone as a team. Fortunately, we had enough advance warning this was going to happen that some of the team members did take home particular chassis that needed reworking. We've talked on previous recordings about the fact that we're replacing monostables by bistables to make some parts of the machine work more reliably. And so um, several of the chassis that needed that kind of modification were taken home and, and people worked on them. And one of our volunteers, a man called Simon Porter, um, who worked for British Telecom before retiring, He's given himself the task of checking all the chassis against the drawings and correcting the drawings if they're wrong. And so he did a lot of that work also. When the museum reopened in September, the volunteers started coming back. We were pleased to find that the machine had not deteriorated during the time we'd left it turned off. And so we were able to resume the commissioning activities where we'd left them back in March. At that time, we'd got the machine to the point where it would, from time to time, run a simple program that was a, a series of no-ops, um, finishing with a, a program stop, a Z instruction, and we quickly got that working again. That tells us quite a bit of the machine is correct. The whole clock and digit pulse system has to be working we have to be able to read program orders out of the main store, so that is working, and the mechanism called coincidence, which is the way in which the, the computer synchronizes with delay lines, that has to be working. And a certain amount of main control has to be working to do the instruction fetch and decode. So that's where we restarted. The, the next step, um, and that's a step which we've accomplished since we've been back in the last month or so, is to change that program so rather than just being a sequence that ends with a stop, it becomes a loop. So at the end of the sequence of no ops, there's a jump instruction that goes back to the beginning, and in principle, the program should keep going round and round. Now, it's not that simple because EDSAC didn't have an unconditional jump instruction. You could jump if the accumulator in the arithmetic unit was positive or zero, or you could jump if it was negative. So actually, the program has both jumps at the end because we have no idea what value might be in the accumulator. Um, and so it has to take one of those two jumps at the end of the sequence and go back. That's an important next step because that testing whether the accumulator is zero, positive or negative is done by the arithmetic unit. And so now we're checking the handshaking between the main control decoding and the arithmetic unit. And the team have mostly got that working. Um, we've had some issues on the way, um, but now that program seems to be fairly reliable. So now we move on to the, the third um, step, if you like, in our testing, and that is to start to introduce the instructions that, as part of their action, either read or write data from memory. And the first instruction we're going to explore is the simplest. It, lo it loads the multiple can register in the arithmetic unit from the store. And this involves extra pulses. We have to read the instruction, decode it, then read the store again to read the data that wants to go into the multiple account register, tell the arithmetic unit that all that has been set up, and then the arithmetic unit has to capture the data into the accumulator. And that's where we join the team today. So, hold on a moment. I need three hands here. Right. Um, I'll take this off now. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can see your screen. Yeah, yeah I'm, just gonna screen. Send, I'm just sending stuff to Nigel now. Right, so that's, that's answered. Yeah, okay. Let me just ch change to a different share. How do I change it? Mm, share screen. Uh, yeah, I'll just show you Pulse View. 
Right. Um, oh, yeah. we're, running Nigel, we're running Nigel 2 now, attempting to. Yeah. And I'm sending our mob connection rather than it going through the transfer tank. So if I run this and I press the button, see, we're only getting three cycles of X. And when the H comes up, we're not getting an EP back. So that's where we are at this very moment. Now, another difficulty that COVID has given us is we have to find a way of working on EDSAC that respects the, um, the fact that with COVID, you don't want people necessarily working in close proximity. So where in the past, we've had the whole team inside the machine staring at oscilloscopes and logic analyzers and, and chatting to each other, that really isn't practical. So we've had to think of a different way of working. What you'll see today is one of our volunteers is in the machine working on main control, Tony Abbey, and he is setting up oscilloscopes and logic analyzers to monitor what the machine is doing when they try to run the test program. You'll also see the occasional appearance of another volunteer, Nigel Benet, who's the man who designed the arithmetic unit, commenting to Tony whether main control is sending him the right signals, which they are, and then Nigel's arithmetic unit is supposed to send a signal back to main control, and Tony can't see that signal. And so they're trying to work out between them what's going wrong. I, I saw it not setting properly. And other colleagues, in particular James Barr, who's the volunteer who designed main control, he is connecting in using Zoom from his home to be able to talk to Tony and see what's on the screens, what's on the oscilloscopes, discuss what they're seeing, decide what changes to make, and then working as if they were all present in the machine. I just wonder whether the biasing or something like that is just disturbing the set action of FF1. Because the problem here, you're in continuous mode at the moment, so it keeps updating from the scope screen. Yeah. Um, I'm, ah, now you see I can trigger, oh, it's gone into funny mode now. If I can make a, a suggestion, it, it would improve your chances of getting somewhere if, if you move the operand address for the H order along a, another cycle or two. Move it to yeah. 10 or 12. Yes, I don't have that ability here. That's Tom's laptop. That's something James can do tomorrow because it's, it's loaded into the Arduino ROM at the moment. What is interesting is the, the modern aids that we can use to commission our EDSAC that would not have been available to the original EDSAC pioneers. We have a logic analyzer which feeds into a laptop and that laptop runs some software called PulseView. And PulseView is quite clever. It allows us to label different signals. It analyzes their waveforms and it will show them as logical ones and zero type pulses, um, if that's the kind of waveform they actually are. And even more helpful, if you have a sequence of pulses that together are to be interpreted for example, as a number, an order number, or an address, it can even tell you what that sequence of pulses decodes into. And so with that kind of high-level diagnostic, you'll hear Tony and James talking about seeing the instructions being executed, one following another, seeing the memory being invited to fetch data, and seeing the control signals and discovering that at some point, there's a control signal issued by main control, and they're expecting an answer from the arithmetic unit, but sadly it never comes. That, that decode you were seeing of um, address three, that's the FF1 flip flop, the coincidence of FF1, yeah. that's the decode there. Uh, and then this, this is the start of the H instruction, so the SCT bus has swapped over to look at the order. Yeah. You can see we've only got puny green spikes here, exactly what right. you were saying, James. It's not it's failing to set. So you've got a weak set action when yeah. Yeah. in mode. You'll see Tony demonstrating or connecting two different um, kinds of screen by Zoom. The first is a direct image from an oscilloscope which is showing you specific waveforms. Sometimes when we find we have problems, 
it's not so much the problem is with the logic, it's with the actual signals themselves. Perhaps the circuits aren't generating high enough voltages, perhaps the pulses are not clean enough in their shape. And so while the logical picture we're seeing through the logic analyzer might look correct, when you actually look with an oscilloscope at what the actual waveform is like, Sometimes that gives you a hint that we need to do some work at that electronic level before the logic level is actually going to work properly. And then when he's not looking with the oscilloscope at the actual waveforms, he'll go back to looking at the logical view where we can present a lot more information, but it's assumed that the waveforms that we've analysed into those logical signals have actually been accepted by the rest of EDSAC as logical signals. So you've seen the team are back together and, and making good progress despite the disruptions caused by COVID. So what's our, our plan going forward? What are the next steps? Well, we need to have main control working perfectly in harmony with the arithmetic unit. And so we have to make sure that the instructions that read and write data work correctly. This is a matter of the the function of the state machine inside main control itself. And indeed, we'll be able to see if the arithmetic unit, which has been tested standalone, actually works properly with, with main control. One of the big issues when we connect big subsystems together in EDSAC is making sure they have a consistent view of the timing of what is going on, because there are different delays in different parts of the machine. And if things don't line up, then complete chaos breaks out because what one part of the machine thinks is the start of a number, maybe another part thinks is the middle or the end. So there are a lot of synchronization issues that I suspect we're going to have to investigate. But once we've got most of the instructions set in place, then um, the work will move to something called the transfer unit. At the moment, we're working with what the pioneers called long numbers, these are numbers stored in two adjacent words of memory. But you could also, in the original EDSAC, compute with short numbers, which are numbers held in one word. And to make that work, there has to be a system that delays the single word until it lines up with the right place in the, in the double length accumulator. That's done by something called the transfer unit. That is designed as a logical entity. It's not yet been constructed and tested. And so we'll have to do the transfer unit, and then we'll have fully replicated all the arithmetic capabilities of EDSAC. Following that, the next big step will be to address input output. We have built the electronics to drive the paper tape reader, and that's been tested standalone. We're in the process of building the electronics to drive the teleprinter, and EDSAC had a somewhat modified teleprinter. We've We've made those modifications. So hopefully we can connect that into the machine. There'll be some challenges there again, because paper tape readers and teleprinters transfer data very, very slowly because they're mechanical devices. And so there's another kind of synchronization there. It's, it's done differently. And so we'll have to make that work. Then the final step will be to load programs using the initial orders. The initial orders unit is working. We've demonstrated it inserting programs into memory. And that's not how we run our test programs at the moment. We have a, a slightly more convenient way of doing it using some modern electronics. So we're guaranteed to have exactly the program we want. But we need to commission initial orders. Then we can load programs from paper tapes. And we'll pretty much have the full EDSAC. So we've not yet connected any of the nickel delay lines to the machine. Uh, we're making life simple for ourselves by using the, the semiconductor delay lines. The short delay lines are ready to be connected. They are well tested and we're, we're confident they're reliable enough to, to be useful. The, de the long delay lines are still under a certain amount of development. We are constructing them. They're working reasonably well but we would like them to be somewhat more reliable and have a lower error rate. And so while um, other people are working on main control and the arithmetic unit and so forth, the team working on the memory led by Peter Lennington 
are using that opportunity to absolutely tune up their delay lines to work as well as they possibly can. In terms of physical construction, most of the things we need are actually there and in the racks. While we've not wired up input, output, initial orders, those chassis are in the racks or they're ready to be connected to the racks. The short delay lines are sitting, waiting to be connected. All the cabling is in place. That was a, a major exercise laying the, the wires for that. So there's little left now to do in terms of making things. Um, the, the main omission that I can think of is the transfer unit. Um, we do have a, an early um, version of that that was built, but we need to, take, need to take it out and make it differently. We've learned somewhat more how it's supposed to work um, and had to correct the, the logic for it. But in terms of making things, there's not a huge amount to do. It is all about commissioning, testing the circuits, making adjustments so that everything is nicely synchronized, so that all the signals that go between the major subsystems are nice and clean, so that we have a machine that will work reliably. And of course, we're learning a lot as we do that. Many of the problems that we're encountering, we're hoping won't be an issue for when we come to maintain the machine in regular operation, because by then we'll have got it working to a, a very high standard. And of course, from all this commissioning work, we have quite good insights now as to where to look first when things aren't behaving as they should. So as we have our struggle with EDSAC to get it working, I think back to how it must have been for the pioneers led by Wilkes. They didn't have modern laptops and signal analyzers and Zoom to help them do the work. They had quite primitive early oscilloscopes and simple voltmeters. Um, and we wonder how they went about debugging the machine. And they didn't even have the knowledge that we have that it would eventually work. To them, at times, it must have appeared to be very, very daunting. And of course, they had no previous experience of building a computer either. The team had come from a background in, in radar systems, in instrument making, uh, radio and so forth. It was all very, very new and very, very exciting and they had the most primitive of tools. We're privileged that we know EDSAC worked. We have a lot of the information um, that they wrote down in their, their papers and publications to, to guide us, and we have all our modern technology to help us in our task. But of course, they were working on the machine as a team of, I'm not sure how many, maybe six to 10 people, working um, five to six days a week, so that made them in some ways more productive, um, but our tools are perhaps giving us the, um, the benefit of being able to be equally productive, even though there are a few of us and we can each perhaps only give a day or two a week to the project.